Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to seven. Hello, Sinclair Electrical Services. Kevin speaking. Oh, good morning. Um, I believe you do television repairs. That's right, we do. Well, my television's not working, but I don't have a car. Can you come round to see it? That shouldn't be a problem. Good. <laughs> Can I just take a few details then? Certainly. So, if I could start with your name. Yes, it's Mrs. Douglas. D O U G L A S. It's double S at the end, actually. Okay, and the address? One three five Park Hill Avenue. In Somerton. That's right. And would you like my phone number? Yes, please. It's seven six five four eight two. Four two eight. No, eight two. Okay, right. So, what's the problem with the television? Um, low volume. Even when you turn it up to maximum, it doesn't seem to make much difference. I mean, it's quite an old TV, but it's always worked perfectly well up to now, and the picture's okay.、Mm. I, I did wonder. We had a power cut a couple of days ago, and it's not been right since then. I don't know if that could have affected it. It certainly might have something to do with it. Anyway, I'll come over and have a look.、Uh, can you tell me the make and model number by any chance? The number will be on the back of the TV.、Mm, um, yes, it's a、uh, Schneider. That's S C H N E I D E R, and the model numbers.、Um, let me see. Yes, it's S W V five double O two. Right. Is that a fairly recent model?、Mm, not really. I got it seven years ago. I remember the date because it was the year after I moved into this house, and that was eight years ago. I hope you can fix it. I really don't want to buy another one. Now listen and answer questions eight to ten. Well, I'll see what I can do when I come round to the house to look at it. I think I know your road. Is it the one that's off the high street? That's right. The house is on the left. If you're coming from the high street, just before the road bends to the right, I'm afraid it's getting harder and harder to park on the road. But if you drive on round the bend, you can usually find somewhere. That's all right. Now let's see. When would it be convenient for me to come round? Well, as soon as possible, really. Well, what's today? Friday. I'm booked up today, and then we've got the weekend. So I'm afraid it looks like Monday morning's the earliest. You can't come tomorrow. Well, Saturday morning I'm in the showroom, and I don't work Saturday afternoon and Sunday. Okay, I'll make sure I'm in. Oh, and one last thing, I wonder if you'd mind telling me how you heard about us. We've just opened a new web page, and we're interested to see how effective it is. No, I actually heard about you from the woman next door. She couldn't remember your number, but I looked it up in the phone book. Oh right, it's always the best advertising, word of mouth. Right, okay. Thank you, Mrs. Douglas. Thank you. Goodbye. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fourteen. Hello, everyone, and I'd like to welcome you all to Rotorua, one of the most famous destinations in New Zealand, where we have a long history of welcoming visitors. I'd like to explain a bit about the geography of this amazing region, famous for its geothermal activity, and tell you what we've planned for your stay. Well, if you'd like to have a look at the map of the region that's in your welcome pack, if you find Lake Rotorua on the top left, the big triangular lake, we've just driven down along State Highway Five (SH5) down the western side of the lake, and then we turned off through the town, and we're here at the Lakes Motel, just around the southern tip of the lake. Okay? Now tomorrow we'll be heading off along SH30 in the opposite direction from the town, towards Lake Rotoita, where we'll be visiting the Hell's Gate Thermal Reserve. This is the area between the SH30 road and the lake, and I'll be telling you more about this in a minute. We'll then be returning to the motel, and in the afternoon we'll be visiting the town of Rotorua itself, and also the Arts and Crafts Institute, which is just along the SH30 from the motel, where it meets the SH5 outside the town. 
Now, if you look directly out of the motel towards the southeast, in the opposite direction to Lake Rotorua, you can just see the peak of Mount Tarawera. And the day after tomorrow, we'll be visiting the volcanic valley which was formed when this last erupted. We'll drive down the SH5 and then head off towards Lake Rotamahana. The valley's on the opposite side of the lake from the mountain, so you can see what a powerful effect the eruption had. There's also an interesting archaeological site. A village buried by the same eruption on the western shores of Lake Tarawera, just to the north. But I'm afraid we won't have time to visit that as a group, although you may wish to go there on your own. However, on the way back towards Rotorua along the SH5, we'll be stopping at Tamaki Village, which is on the main road about 12 kilometres outside town. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. So now let me tell you a bit more about these attractions. Just driving past the lake and through the town, I'm sure you've realised this is somewhere quite different from anywhere else in the world. So tomorrow, we'll start by visiting Hell's Gate Thermal Reserve. This is the most active area of the region volcanically and you'll see New Zealand's largest boiling whirlpool, where the water is actually 100 degrees centigrade, together with the largest hot waterfall in the Southern Hemisphere, where it's a more comfortable 40 degrees centigrade, just right for a hot shower. Entry is just $12 for adults and $6 for children. We'll come back to the motel for lunch, after which we'll visit the Arts and Crafts Institute, where you can learn about Maori people who lived here before the Europeans came. There's a display of Maori carving showing this traditional skill at its most impressive and exhibitions where you can learn about the use of geothermal waters for cooking food and for medicinal purposes. Entry is free and you'll find plenty to do there for the whole afternoon. The following day we'll be visiting another highlight of the region, the Volcanic Valley. This is a very new part of New Zealand. The valley was formed less than 150 years ago in 1886 when Mount Tarawera erupted violently, completely destroying the beautiful pink and white terraces that used to attract tourists to the region. After lunch, you can take a boat trip to see the volcanic activity at the edge of the lake. That's $25 for adults and $5 for children. We'll then be spending the afternoon learning more about traditional Maori life and pre-European New Zealand at Tamaki Village. As you walk around this recreated village, your Maori guide will tell you more about this traditional culture, and as the sun sets, you can enjoy a traditionally cooked feast known as the hangi, that's H-A-N-G-I, consisting of meat and vegetables cooked over hot stones, which are placed in a hole in the ground and covered with earth. And there's no extra charge for this, it's all included in the basic cost of your holiday. Now does anyone have any questions? Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Could there be clearer proof of the arrogance and indifference of those who are supposed to keep our food safe than the muzzling of John Verrill? Agriculture is a business, true, and businesses have to make money. But this shows how ministers and officials put the profits of the agriculture business before the well-being of the British people. Mr. Verrill, a pharmaceutical chemist, was appointed to represent consumers on one of the many committees that advise the government on food safety. When he tried to do his job, though, and wanted to warn ministers of a danger to children's health, he was refused permission to do so. The danger comes from hormones given to cattle in the USA and some other countries to make them grow faster. They speed up the animal's development to maturity thus making meat production more profitable. There have, however, long been fears that the hormones have horrendous effects on the people who eat them, causing diseases as serious as cancer. Once these hormones were used on British cattle too, but over 20 years ago they were banned in Europe for being too dangerous. Indeed, so concerned is the European Union that it banned imports of hormone-fed beef years ago, much to the fury of the US government, which wants to sell it all over the world. Several years ago, the USA and Canada asked the World Trade Organization to declare the ban illegal 
and to punish Europe for failing to lift it. The WTO, with its long record of refusing to let environmental or safety concerns interfere with trade, agreed, imposing fines of more than $120 million a year on the EU for its refusal to back down. The British government now backs the Americans, claiming that there is no proof that hormone fed beef does any harm. This is where Mr. Verrill comes in. He is very angry with the government. Especially as their claim comes out just after a Danish study shows that growth hormones are 200 times more dangerous than was previously thought. Worried by these findings, Mr. Verrill spoke to government representatives, who did nothing. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Not only that, but they have not been testing beef which is imported, which, by law, they are required to do. This directly affects the British public, as about 40% of the beef British people eat comes from abroad, supposedly from countries like Brazil, which does not allow the use of growth hormones. Brazilian beef is stocked by some British supermarkets and widely used in catering. Yet, when a Brazilian farm was recently visited by EU inspectors, a large stockpile of this banned substance was found. This is not the first food scandal we have had in our country. Take the present concern over a well known chocolate company. Several months ago, The company found out that its sweets were contaminated with a rare form of salmonella, but they did nothing about it, leaving their sweets in the shops to be bought by the unsuspecting public. It was not until five months later, when several children had suffered food poisoning, that the chocolate bars were removed from the shelves. It makes you wonder how many other dangerous foods have been allowed onto our plates. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Does your work bring you into contact with many overseas students, Samantha? Occasionally. As you know, a solicitor's work is to advise people about their rights when they have any problems understanding how the law operates. They may need help because of injury to themselves or their property if they've been attacked or robbed, for example. But these are not by any means the main problems I deal with. Really? We know more about crime, I suppose, because we read about it in the newspaper or see it on TV. What other things do people come to you for help with? There are lots of things which don't get nearly so much attention. Sometimes it's to do with relationships in the community as when bills aren't paid, or contracted work isn't completed, or neighbours disagree. At other times, it's to do with people not understanding the law and their responsibilities, and this is probably where overseas students have the most difficulty. One interesting example is customs laws, something which every new arrival has to come up against. What is it that overseas students find most difficult to understand about Australian customs regulations? I think it's a shock to many people arriving here for the first time to find out how many things are prohibited. Everyday food items, for example. I mean, when I've been travelling overseas, I've been quite amazed at the lack of concern in some countries about food being brought in from other parts of the world without any check. You mean people arriving into other countries don't have to declare any foodstuffs at all? In some countries, there are lots of warnings about drugs and firearms, and there are usually limits on alcohol and tobacco, and perhaps perfume. But foods not mentioned. Yes, I suppose I never thought about it till I came here. You can take anything you like into England as far as food is concerned. You see, here, you can't even drive from one state to another with a few apples and oranges for the journey. 
There are signs to remind you not to bring any fruit into some states, though they don't usually search your bags unless there's a fruit fly epidemic or something. Hmm. <laughs> With those kinds of regulations between states, it's no wonder that they're so strict about what you can bring in from overseas. Of course, farmers would be wiped out if some pests were introduced which destroyed their whole crop. It's easy to understand why you should take steps to prevent that. And with food being such an important part of many cultures, it can be difficult for some people to realize they're not allowed to bring in delicacies from home for friends and relatives here. I'm defending someone at the moment who has exactly that problem. Oh,、uh, what happened? It's an interesting case. Have you got time for a cup of coffee? I'll tell you about it if you like. That'd be great.